my name is Winnie and I am an Open Education Project Manager at Spark. Today I'm going to be introducing the newly launched resource in 2021, the Automatic Textbook Billing Contract Library. Before we get started today, I do want to disclose that I am not a lawyer and none of the information in this presentation is intended to be used as legal advice. So the first is the definition of automatic textbook billing. It's usually commonly known as brand names like Inclusive Access or First Day, and it can be through the bookstore or directly through publishers. These programs charge the cost of digital course materials directly to a student's bill, often without their consent. So what we've done so far in our process is we assembled a Inclusive Access Working Group in April of 2020. That group recommended that we send out our first round of FOIA requests, which are Freedom of Information Act requests, in June of 2020, and then again we sent more in April 2021. And we launched in May 2021 the Automatic Textbook Billing Contract Library that you will see later today. The contract library currently hosts 70 plus contracts from 37 institutions in 24 different states. The breakdown of these institutions, states, um, can be found in that spreadsheet. So here's a little preview of what the spreadsheet will look like. This is what you'll see. You'll see a few of these columns, a source, institution, link to contract, so you can actually see which contracts we receive, who the vendor is, what the type of contract is, when the contract was signed, when the end date was, if there was an extension, what the original contract length was, who it was signed by, what services are provided, the discounts that they potentially offer, and what quotas there are if there are any in the contract, um, what maximum resale rates there are for the bookstores, any terms of service that we see, student data, print restrictions, access restrictions, any addendums, you'll see all of that in these columns and it's a lot of information for each contract. We would like to pause here and just give recognition and acknowledge all of the community members who built this um, resource. So we have a few names here from our Inclusive Access Working Group and many of these contracts are also um, in the contracts library that was published by US PERG and they have a report called Automatic Textbook Billing and Offer Students Can't Refuse that can provide amazing information on this topic as well. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into the contracts. There are four types of contracts. There are bookstore, content delivery systems, consortiums, and publishers. The first time we'll dive into is bookstore contracts. These are typically contracts that are signed as addendums to existing bookstore contracts with your university. And they'll look a little bit like this. So you have a full out access program as an addendum and they'll show you exactly what's in here, what the opt out is pricing, all of this. And you'll see that this was a third amendment um, to add these services. These contracts, it's less likely for us to see discounts or quotas or anything like that because those deals are made between the bookstore and the publisher and we do not have access to those under the Freedom of Information Act. Next, we'll go on to publisher. So this is your most typical one that we see. Um, before we jump right in though, it is important to establish what the quota means. It's any provision in the contract that is conditioned on the institution meeting a certain threshold of students, courses, or units. So there can be penalties if these quotas do not get met. So I'll show you an example from Onondaga Community College. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Uh, it's minimum usage rates, so the sell-through rate needs to be 90%, and if there aren't 90%, there can be consequences for that. You can see here in Cape Fear, it's a little bit different. This is exact enrollments, so it's 1,000 enrollments for a semester, or 1,600, and 3,000 for the entire calendar year, um, and you have to meet those enrollment rates. Then there are also print restrictions in these publisher contracts. And these are limits on the ability for students to print the material they're charged for. So a common example is you can't print more than 10% of the book, or you can't copy and paste 10% of the ebook. Another one is um, pricing. So you have to add additional price to get a print version, um, plus any kind of shipping costs as well. 
You'll also have access restrictions in these contracts. So any limits on accessing the course materials, um, so things like expiration dates on the amount of access you get, number of devices. So here you see um, user session for hosted content will expire after 60 minutes of inactivity. Uh, you are not allowed to have more than two concurrent devices owned by the same user. Um, here you'll say, see that it has you have only have access for 12 months um, and only have two personal computing devices to access those materials. Then we also have discount structures. So how these discounts and our pricing structures are mentioned in the contract, if there are any. So here you see the McGraw-Hill um, contract where you can see the discounted fees. So they'll show you exactly how much it costs per book. Cengage does it a little bit different. So Missouri City State is a great um, example here. So if you buy, so if you have a discount rate, so you bring in less than 200,000 a year, then these are your discount rates. You get 5% off of these courses, 15% off these, 25% off these. If you have a discount rate where you have two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars you're spending in inclusive access each year, you get a higher discount rate. So it bumps you up to seven point five to twenty percent to thirty percent. Then, if you have more than five hundred thousand dollars per year racked up in inclusive access fees uh, or charges, then you are actually in in this contract you can get a ten percent, twenty five percent, thirty five percent discount um, according to their discount structure. And of course, Pearson, who has their net prices and catalogs, um, they will sometimes show prices in the contract like they do here, um, and they'll sometimes just say 25% off of the catalog price, and that catalog is not able to be um, requested in the Freedom of Information Act because it's private um, and, and could disrupt business. And then you'll also see here in a percentage format, 25% of the then current online purchase price. You know, there are a few things that we also wonder in these publisher contracts, um, things like syllabus changes. So we've seen some instances in, of, you know, syllabi before the inclusive access contracts and after where syllabus changes 15% to rely on purchasing these books that come with um, you know, softwares that become homework or quizzes. And then also if the institutions are making any revenue in this process, it's not very transparent in the contracts that we see right now, what institutions are making off of these. But if there is um, money to be made on these, then I, it should be kind of transparent. And we want to look into these two things as we continue our research into automatic textbook billing. And so I'll show you an example of the grades here. So this was a University of Florida Warrington class. You can see beforehand there are three exams, a chapter quiz, and a syllabus. Afterwards, the th there are still three exams, those quizzes. There's a new category of kind of homework that's at 42, 14 chapters, and three points. Um, and so, you know, it is a little bit different. I believe that this became 11% reliant on purchasing that textbook. And then you can see here the maximum resale price is usually 15 to 20 percent for um, Pearson. They set that pretty strictly. We see it in a few times in Cengage and McGraw Hill, but largely Pearson is very strict on 15 percent resale price. So whatever they sell you, the bookstore, the book at, the bookstore can only increase it by at most 15 percent. You know, we have some next steps that we are considering um, and that's looking into kind of these these things, maybe potentially hosting more community sessions on automatic textbook billing. Great. And thank you so much for attending or watching this automatic textbook billing video. If you have any questions, our team would be delighted to help you answer or point you in the right direction for any resources that we are aware of on automatic textbook billing, especially if your campus is considering it and or you're trying to stop it. Um, you can contact Nicole at sparkopen.org um, and I'll leave that in the video description um, and we can get you some of that information. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you're able to find use in the Automatic Textbook Billing Contract Library resource.